section. So I'm going to present, are we there yet? And this is a joint work with Avichai Cohen, Amir Herzberg, Michael Shapira, and Chaya Shulman. And this talk is really focused on RPKI, its deployment and security properties. So let me start with a clear and brief reminder of what RPKI is. So the resource public key infrastructure, or the RPKI, maps networking objects. And specifically, I'm going to focus on IP prefixes to the organizations that own them. And RPKI is really intended to do two things. So the first one is to prevent prefix and subprefix hijacks. And the second one is to lay, sort of lay the cryptographic foundation uh, for protection against more sophisticated path manipulation attacks uh, on interdomain routing, routing. And specifically, it lays the cryptographic foundation and the keying mechanisms behind BGPSEC. So let me just quickly remind what prefix and subprefix hijacks are. Uh, so assume we have uh, one, one legitimate origin for, uh, for a prefix, AS3320. And that AS announces its prefix 91.0/10 to ASY. So now ASY learns a route to, that, to the IP addresses within that prefix and sends its traffic there. Uh, and also forwards that advertisement on to ASX, of course, appending its own uh, identifier to the route. So now ASX learns some route uh, to this prefix. But the attacker at AS666 announces the same prefix. So now ASX had learned two outs, and it needs to choose. Um, and let's say that ASX chooses uh, using, the, using the shortest path rule. So now, so now traffic flows to, uh, to AS666 instead of the legitimate owner of the prefix. To demonstrate subprefix hijacks, I've moved uh, ASY to the, to the other side of the graph. So uh, the legitimate owner still announces its prefix, and it reaches ASX. And now AS666 announces a subprefix of that. So a slash 16, a more specific prefix. Uh, ASY sends its traffic there and also relays that to ASX. And now ASX learns uh, a route to the prefix and a route to the subprefix. And traffic to the subprefix follows the longest prefix MAC rule. So uh, in fact, the path length here does not matter, and traffic will flow to the attacker. So how does RPKI prevent that? Uh, well, RPKI certifies ownership over IP prefixes. So to do that, it assigns uh, an IP prefix to a public key through a resource certificate, or an RC. And, uh, and let, for now, let's assume that these RCs are, cannot be forged and they are cryptographically signed by someone who's authorized to do so. I'm going to slightly talk about, uh, about the chain of trust in RPKI later on. Um, and then the, the owner who owns the private key that corresponds to the public key specified in the RC can now sign a route origin authorization record, or OA, uh, which is then published uh, and is public domain, so everyone can know about it. And the OI identifies, identifies the ASs who are authorized to advertise that prefix in BGP. So going back to my example, uh, prefix 91.0/10 actually belongs to Deutsche Telekom, and uh, and they were uh, they took some measures in order to protect their prefix, so they got certified by RIPE. Uh, the root of trust for the European domain. And they also use the, use the RC to issue a ROA. So now there's a ROA that uh, everyone should know about, uh, protecting prefix 91.0 10. And uh, the ROA also specifies a maximum length, which is the most specific prefix that Deutsche Telekom allows to announce uh, for this prefix. And in this case, it is 10. So uh, you, only that particular prefix is allowed. And uh, the only origin that's allowed to, to announce it is AS3320. So how can, how can this help to prevent prefix and subprefix hijacks? Um, going back to my example, uh, now ASX knows about this, about this ROA, so it knows that the only origin that's allowed to announce this prefix is 3320. 
And so it, it can identify that the attacker's prefix is actually, uh, is actually uh, the attacker's announcement is actually invalid, and so it can discard it, and traffic will flow in the correct direction to ASY and then to the, to the legitimate owner at 3320. So, uh, so in this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, divide the remainder of this talk to three parts. So the first one is going to be, is going to be about the obstacles facing the deployment of RPKI. And I'm going to start about talking insecure, about insecure deployments. So really, like any other security mechanism, uh, it allows the freedom of choice, and uh, you, might, you might deploy it in an insecure manner. And specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, what we call loose ROAS. So consider this similar topology now, where we have the legitimate owner at ASA, and that owner had advertised the ROAR for its own prefix. So uh, it has a ROAR for its less 16, and you can see that the ROAS maximum length allows precisely that uh, that IP that the IP prefix to be to be published by ASA. So, what can our attacker do? Uh, well, it can, it can it could try to circumvent the RPKI defense, and doing that by uh, by announcing. Oh wait, so ASA announces that, and our attacker. Can can circumvent uh, the RP, can try to circumvent the RPKI defense by sort of announcing um, a, announcing a false path to ASA. So in this case, the attacker sort of makes up a link to ASA, and and now this advertisement looks valid according to the RPKI because A is the actual origin that's specified in the advertisement, and uh, and that's the origin that's allowed by the RPKI. The maximum length. Uh, is not uh, is valid, uh, and so ASX receives that receives that advertisement too. And which way would it go? Well, it's likely to go with the shorter path. So still, traffic is likely to flow in the correct direction. Um, and there have been actually extensive studies about that. And th this attack is actually called the one hop attack in the in the paper that I'm citing. And, uh, and there it was shown to be much less effective than, than regular prefix hijacks. So I'm going to consider that as a sort of a win for, for the RPKI. So that is a good thing that RPKI can achieve. But now consider the case where the maximum length is actually pretty permissive. So ASA, instead of, uh, saying, instead of writing uh, 16 as the maximum length, actually specifies 24. So now the ROA is really loose. The, the ROA allows for advertising prefixes that are not being actually advertised by ASA. Um, and well, our attacker can take advantage of that. So it would carry the exact same attack, except instead of the slash 16, it would say slash 24. And that means that according to the longest prefix match rule, the traffic will actually flow uh, to the attacker at 666. So let me just uh, say that this attack is also mentioned in RFC 7115 uh, in one of the examples. And there it's mentioned as sort of um, an attack that's less likely to be noticed. But I actually want to emphasize that this attack is actually more likely to succeed ex precisely because they attack a sub prefix. So uh, just to recap, why does this attack work? So we have the attacker at 666, and it claims to be a neighbor of ASA, but the RPKI does not provide any mechanism that allows to make sure that this is valid. Um, ASA does not actually originate the, the, the prefix that the attacker targets, the slash 24, so the raw is loose, um, and, uh, but the raw is loose and allows that. And finally, the longest prefix match rule uh, ensures that uh, that for most ASs, the attacker, the hijacker is actually going to get the traffic, um, and this is regardless of where it is located in the network. Um, so, how common are these insecure deployments? Well, it turns out they are pretty common. So, uh, around 30% of the prefixes that are covered by RPKI are actually sort of unprotected uh, because of that. Um, and about 89% of the prefixes with maximum length that's larger than the prefix length, so 
prefix says that are taking advantage of this maximum length property uh, are actually vulnerable. So almost everyone who's taking advantage of it. And finally, I want to also point out that it actually manifests some large providers. So we've seen some really important, uh, important organizations that have used a very permissive uh, length in the ROAS. And this vulnerability is actually, uh, should be solved when BGPSEC is deployed, but we have a long time until then. So uh, until, until then, we actually better not issue loose ROAS and use the minimum maximum length that's required. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the human error factor. And, uh, and it turns out that in the RPKI, there are many other mistakes uh, that, that people have made. And specifically, there are bad ROAS, which, cause, which can cause legitimate prefixes to appear as invalid if you're doing uh, route origin validation according to the RPKI. And specifically, uh, that might cause for someone who's doing filtering uh, to, to disconnect from legitimate destinations. And there have been extensive measurements about that. Um, so let me just point out that out of the about 6.5% of the prefixes that are covered, that are announced in BGP and are covered by the RPKI, about uh, just over 8% are invalid. And another almost 30% are valid, but are actually unprotected because of these loose laws that I've shown you earlier. Um, so we've also done a, a short survey, a short anonymous survey for network operators uh, in this work. And we've asked them what, what is the main concern uh, regarding doing RPKI-based origin authentication in your network. And as you can see, the, uh, a very important thing that, that was pointed out is actually being disconnected from, from destinations. So this is a true concern about, uh, about RPKI used in practice. Um, and so then we checked who, who are the organizations behind these bad ROAS. And so here on the plot you can see on the x-axis the number of ROAS issuers and on the y-axis uh, the fraction of, uh, of errors that, that these uh, ROAS cause. And what we found was actually some pretty good news because it seems that only a few organizations are actually, uh, have actually issued the ROAS causing most of the, of the problems. So we actually view this as very good news because uh, some focused effort and, and maybe some convincing uh, for these guys might improve the integrity of the information in the RPKI quite a bit. And the last thing that I want to talk about in this part of the talk are inter-organizational dependencies. So there are two inter-organizational dependencies that, that RPKI uh, sort of encapsulates. And the first one is the downward dependency, which is a dependency in issuing a ROA. So uh, specifically consider the following scenario. There is a, a regional, uh, there is an IRR, uh, an RIR uh, who holds a root certificate for the domain. They have uh, allocated, they have signed a certificate, an RC for some provider with a slash eight. Uh, now that provider uh, in the, in the decades that it, it, it has this, uh, this IP prefix, had sold parts of it to some customers. Now as, as soon as that, uh, that provider issues, goes on and issues a ROA for its own IP prefix, it would make customer announcements that are not covered by ROAs to actually appear invalid. So, uh, so and the reason is that these customers will now be perceived as sort of sub-prefix hijackers, although they are the legitimate owners of their IP prefixes. Um, so we've measured. So for how many, uh, so, so for how many prefixes and, and what portion of the IP address space there actually exists at dependencies? And what we've seen is again some good news. So this does not apply for a whole lot of organizations and IP prefixes. And as, as you can see here, most are not actually dependent. Some bad news that come with that is that those that, actu that are actually dependent are, are really important. So uh, you can see here again a CDF, and the x-axis describes the number of organizations. The y-axis describes the fraction of, 
of, of, down, of download dependencies either for prefixes or for the IP address space. And you can see that really most of the dependent IP address space belongs to just a few organizations, suggesting that their IP address space is quite large. And, and then the other side of, of these dependencies uh, is the dependency in issuing a certificate. So now consider the following similar scenario. We have the same provider, but now that provider did not uh, bother to get an RC. So the provider does not have an RC, but uh, now he, he, its customers want to join the RPKI. So they, want, so they need an RC, except the provider does not have an authorized key to sign the allocation. So this might be a, a, deployment, practice, a, a deployment problem in practice, uh, especially in case that this chain between the, the RIR who holds the RC in, in this case and the customers is quite long. Um, uh, the, the customers might try to go to the RIR, to the RIR and get them certified directly. Um, it, it might be, so, there might be some challenges in practice in doing that. So uh, this might be an issue. So we've also checked how many organizations are actually upward dependent. And again, some good news. It looks, it looks like not that much. So, so really, the allocation tree is quite shallow. Um, and again, here the x-axis describes the depth of the dependency. And you can see that for most, there's actually no dependency. So that's quite good. Uh, so now I'll talk about some of the, of some mechanism that, a system that we've built to improve the information accuracy recorded in the RPKI. And so our system is called Draw Alert, and it has two sides to it. So one side is a web interface that's available at drawalert.org, which allows network operators to check whether their, whether their uh, IP prefixes are properly protected by ROAS, and if not, why not? Um, so if they have a loose ROA, that would indicate that. If, they, if the AS number is wrong, that, that would indicate that and would say what should the AS number be. Um, and also, uh, if they have a too short of a maximum length for what, for what is actually being announced, it would, it would say that and say what would the maximum length be. And finally, uh, if you consider the case that I've shown you earlier of a provider issuing a ROA um, causing its customer to be invalid. Well, in that case, uh, we would also indicate who the provider might be and, what's it, and, and what sort of ROA did it issue that causes the customer to be invalid. Um, now, the other side for, for the ROA alert system is a sort of an online and proactive notification system that alerts uh, network operators about uh, bad or loose ROAs. Uh, so we periodically retrieve the ROAs from the RPKI publication points and compare them against the BGP advertisements uh, that, that we observe. And so we identify, uh, and, and, and we identify problems. So in, case of a, so in case of a loose ROA, we would alert the, the operator, and in case of bad ROAs, we would also alert them. And sometimes uh, the actual offender and victim are not the same organization. So uh, in particular, that provider and customer case that I've shown you, in these cases, we would email both sides. And the email has a pretty descriptive uh, 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 description of the, of the error. And indeed, we, we got some, uh, some promising initial results. So our emails reached 168 victims and offenders. And after, within a month, uh, we've checked what, what happened, and about 40%, 42% of these errors were actually fixed. And this is a significant rate, which we believe is optimistic. And just to clarify some, some of the differences of raw alert from, from other systems, it is constantly monitoring, so it's not just upon registration uh, that, you, that you might get alerted, and also it's not an opt-in. So we constantly monitor and we alert whenever we see something that's bad. Uh, and so we ad really advocate that the alert be, uh, be adopted and adapted uh, by m more significant and less academic body than us. Um, and so for the, so far my talk has focused mostly about the information that's publicly available in the RPKI 
uh, and the ROAS. And now I'm going to shift a bit to the other side, sort of the other side uh, of the RPKI, which is doing route origin validation. So, uh, so I, I will show some first measurements that we have regarding uh, doing route origin validation. And then I'm going to uh, evaluate how good is, is RPKI and route origin validation under partial deployment. So let me first uh, explain a bit what it means to do route origin validation according to uh, the RPKI. And this slightly repeats previous talks, but uh, bear, bear with me. I'm sure you'd find it uh, interesting. So, um, so in order to use the RPKI to do route origin validation, or ROV, the network administrator needs to set up a, a local general purpose machine that runs some software uh, which syncs with the RPKI publication points. So uh, it gets the RCs and ROAs from these publication points, and then it can, it can actually validate that the signatures are correct, and for those records that are, that are fine, uh, it would create sort of a whitelist rules based on these ROAs. And then it would push them to the router to the routers within the autonomous system within the autonomous system. So, uh, really, you can as you can see, the changes to the routers are really minor, uh, and this is a, a big differentiator from BGPsec. So, really, major router, router vendors have, are actually supporting ROV uh, today, and it has a very negligible overhead. So, almost any AS anywhere can do ROV. Uh, so, this is a fairly good start for a new security protocol. So now we're interested in knowing, is it actually being enforced? Uh, so I will now show uh, part of our measurements, uh, which, uh, which, regard, uh, which regard who is not doing ROV. And, and specifically, uh, in order to gain some empirical insights, we actually use invalid advertisements that already exist on the internet. So uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, th there are uh, a lot of those uh, using the RPKI, and that suffices for our study. And we monitor those invalid advertisements uh, through the, the, path, uh, the paths that are observed in the, by the route view sensors. Um, so this is a completely passive study. And let me just point out that there's an, currently an ongoing follow-up study uh, which uses more advanced active techniques. So if you're interested in that, you might want to be on the look for that study when it finishes. So to our measurements. Um, so we consider the following topology where we have uh, two origins and each of them advertises a prefix that is invalid according to the RPKI. Uh, now, uh, in this set of measurements we've, uh, that, I, that I'll present, we're focusing specifically on the AESs that are not doing filtering. So uh, we only care about those that do not discard invalid routes. And to, to see who, the, who these guys are, we simply uh, observe the routes, the invalid, uh, the routes that the invalid advertisements take and then we can point out that all the ESs that relay these advertisements are actually not doing uh, filtering according to the RPKI. So what did we find? Well, we found that at least 80 out of the 100 largest ISPs do not do filtering according to the RPKI. And the reason that, that I'm presenting focused results on these 100 largest ISPs is is dual, so both because for these particular ISPs we can actually uh, see a lot of paths that go through that go through them. So using this passive approach, it's easier to learn about them. And the second one uh, is, as I'm going to show you in in the remainder of my talk, is that these guys turn out to be very important for the security benefits that RBKI can provide. So we've also asked that in our survey, uh, do you apply RPKI-based route origin validation? And uh, you can see that the, the numbers pretty much uh, uh, confirm what we've seen. So about 85% have answered no. 
about 10% have answered yes, but, to deep, but only to deep prefer invalid routes. And, uh, and only about 5% have indicated that they use that in order to discard in, invalid advertisements. Now, let me just talk about this, these 10% who are, who are doing deep preference. Uh, well, it was shown that deep preference actually does not help at all against subprefix hijacks. And because in, in that case, you, you would only be informed of one prefix. So really, uh, you, would deep refer, you don't have anything to deep refer it with, and so you still that AS would fall victim to the attack. And also in case you only have one provider uh, that connects you to the internet, well, you might only receive one advertisement and for, for the prefix and therefore, uh, again, uh, f be full to take it. So, um, so as we've seen, uh, deployment of ROV seems very partial. And uh, so now the question is how good is ROV under partial deployment? And what are the security benefits that we might expect to get from it under such deployment scenarios? Um, and we, we identified two interesting collateral effects. So the first one is the collateral benefit effect, where, uh, where adopters might be able to protect ASs behind them in the internet topology uh, just by discarding invalid routes. So consider this simple topology. So we have the attacker at, AS, the attacker at AS666 and uh, the legitimate prefix owner at AS1. And uh, the owner has a ROA published. So, so anyone who's doing ROV uh, knows about this ROA. And in particular, consider AS2 who is doing ROV and AS3 who does not. So. Uh, so what's going to happen when, uh, so let, uh, let us assume that the attacker tries to do a subprefix hijack. Well, now the, the AS doing ROV at AS2 will actually discard that advertisement. And, and so when the origin advertises its own prefix, the slash 16, that, uh, that advertisement will reach AS3. And therefore, uh, since AS3 is only offered the good route, uh, it will not be fooled, and will actually traffic will actually flow in the right direction. So that is a pretty good effect that that using ROV might have. Uh, now let me talk about the collateral damage of damaging effect that we've seen. So uh, the collateral damage means that in in our context means that ASs who are not doing ROV might actually cause damage to ASs who are doing ROV. So to demonstrate that, I've swapped ASs, AS2 and AS3. So now AS2 um, the, does not adopt uh, and does not perform ROV, while AS3 does. And the first type of collateral damage that I'll show uh, is disconnection. So, uh, so by disconnection, uh, let, let us consider the case where AS2 actually prefers to take route, to, to advertise a route from the attacker at 666 rather than uh, a route from the origin. And now let's consider the case where uh, the origin announces its prefix, the slash 16, and the attacker performs a prefix hijack. Well, in that case, AS2 will actually announce the bad route to AS3. And since AS3 is performing ROV, it will know to discard this route. And since it's not being offered any other route, it will be disconnected from the prefix 1.1 slash 16. So in, non in not adopting, AS2 had actually caused AS3 to disconnect. Um, OK, so you might say, well, this connection is better than reaching, to, than reaching the, wrong, uh, the, the wrong AS. So I prefer, I prefer not to send my traffic at all than, than actually having it reach the wrong destination. Um, but actually, using ROV under partial deployment might cause control plane and data plane mismatch. And, and that means, well, consider the, same, the exact same scenario, except now the attacker is performing a sub-prefix hijack. Well, now AS2 receives two advertisements, and they are for different prefixes. One is for the slash 16, and the other one is for the slash 24. And therefore, it would forward both of them to AS3. 
Now, S3 doing route origin validation would know to discard the attacker's route. Uh, and therefore, it would actually choose to take the correct path when, when uh, sending traffic to, uh, to 1.1.1 slash 24, for, so for the subprefix. But once the traffic reaches AS2, in AS2's table, it actually says that this slash 24 prefix actually needs to be routed to the attacker. So since we don't have source routing on the internet, traffic will actually flow against the decision of AS3 and will actually reach the attacker. So um, the last thing that, we, that we've done in this study is to quantify this collateral damaging and collateral benefit uh, effects. And in order to do that, we've used the simulation framework, uh, which takes the internet graph as well as the inferred uh, relations between ASs. And the simulations work as follows. So uh, every time we pick one adopter and one victim ASs, and uh, we assume that the victim has a ROA to protect its prefix, and then we pick some adopter set, uh, a, a different one for each type of simulations that we're trying to do, and I'll show you a few later. And then we evaluate which of the ASs on the internet would choose to route their traffic uh, to the attacker and which to the victim. Uh, so that would give us the attacker success rate, which is sort of a measure of how good uh, ROV is under this partial deployment. And we repeat that for about for a million uh, victim and attacker pairs. So, um, so first off, let me start by uh, by saying, uh, by, by quantifying the, the security benefits that we gain by having the, these top ISPs adopt. So by top ISPs, I mean uh, the, the ISPs on the internet ordered by the number of clients that they have. And, and here you can see two lines. So the, the green line means that uh, every ISP adopts with probability, every top ISP adopts with probability one, while the red line means uh, that every top ISP adopts with probability one quarter. The x-axis means the expected deployment. So in order to compare these two lines, we really wanted to have the same size of deployments. So uh, if you take the 100 point, for example, for the green line, that means that all the 100 top ISPs have adopted ROV, while for the red line, it means that out of the top 400, so not 100, but 400 top ISPs, uh, each one of them had adopted with probability one quarter. Uh, and so these, uh, these two deployment sets are expected to be equal, yet as you can see, there is a significant difference between them. So while having a 25% adoption rate by the top ISPs, does not uh, substantially harm the, uh, mitigate the attacker's uh, the, the attack, uh, while the subprefix attack is almost completely mitigated uh, when the top 100 uh, ISPs adopt. For the subprefix hijack, you can see the same the same trend. So really, uh, again, the red line, well, in this case, almost does not move. This is precisely because of that collateral damaging effect. Um, while, the, while the green line shows that the attack is diminished. Uh, now, in the, we have an online technical report. Uh, the technical report has, uh, has some more details about these, these, these simulations and also includes some more uh, data points. So, uh, and, and so you can see that at about 75% adoption rate, this gets very close to the green line, while at 50%, we're still pretty close to the red line. Um, So, uh, and, and then the last simulations that I want to show you uh, compare between, uh, between two scenarios. So one is today's status as reflected by our measurements. That's the, that's the red line. And that means that ASs that do not adopt, uh, that, that we found that are not doing ROV filtering, continue not to do that. And while the green line suggests that all the top ISPs start doing ROV. 
the x-axis describes now the adoption rate of ROV filtering in the remainder of the internet. So x-axis at one means that actually everyone, uh, everyone uh, who we don't know to not do ROV start doing ROV. And, and so you can see really at, uh, the, the tremendous effect of this collateral damage. So for the subprefix hijack, even if everyone adopts, uh, it seems that, that a substantial amount of the internet would still get fooled and, and route their traffic to the wrong direction uh, because of the collateral damaging effect caused by, by these core ISPs who we found to not perform filtering. Now, the, the, the green line, on the other hand, is actually quite optimistic. It shows that if we just get these 100 guys to adopt, well, that means that, uh, that the attacker success rate is, is, is rather low. And it continues to diminish until zero uh, for, for that attack as more and more ASs adopt. So uh, really, it seems like adoption by the top 100 ISPs or by the core of the internet can make a huge difference. And the bottom line that I really want to emphasize uh, for these simulations is that it seems that enforcement by the top ISPs is both necessary and very importantly also sufficient to provide some substantial security benefits from the RPKI. So I actually view this as some very good news because that means uh, that if we, that focused effort and incentivizing, incentivizing these guys to adopt might actually provide some uh, critical benefits. So uh, let me just conclude my talk. So uh, I've, I've raised two issues regarding the RPKI. One is information accuracy, and to address that, we presented raw alert, which informs and alerts operators about bad draws, loose draws, and inter-organizational dependencies. And also, I've talked about ways we can use the RPKI to uh, prevent hijacks better. And we found that incentivizing ROV adoption by the top ISPs is actually very critical and is both sufficient and necessary for significant benefits. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my talk, and uh, thank you. Rüdiger Volk, Deutsche Telekom. Thanks for, th thanks for using uh, real-life examples out of our RPKI. Could you yeah. please go back to the previous slide? Th this one? No, no, yes, that one. Um, uh, okay, so uh, on the loose rowers, uh, I wanted to make a little bit of remarks. Um, I was around and in the room when the max length was uh, kind of inserted. The previous design of a protocol had a single bit instead of it. Uh, and that was obviously much worse because that enabled except all more specifics. specifics. Mm -hmm. I guess you can agree that that would have been a really bad idea. I certainly agree. <laughs> okay, so kind of, uh, uh, I think uh, the arguments why uh, uh, injecting the max length instead of asking people to enumerate exactly what they want to announce uh, was based on the experience with customers that we asked to actually do in RPSL exact, uh, uh, exact registration of all the routes they wanted to uh, uh, announce. And uh, well, okay, some operators actually are pretty rigid on it, and we probably belong there, but we know that it's painful and uh, kind of the idea of giving people who really want to be a little bit lazy um, the choice of making them more vulnerable f for, the, for, for, for having a little bit more comfort in doing uh, the registry uh, did, seem, did seem kind of uh, very, very much justified uh, in the real world. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure that holds. However, the education to this and explaining if you do the ROAS for things you are not intending to actually announce, uh, you are creating vulnerability, uh, uh, probably has to be emphasized more. So thank you for this comment. I'd actually love to continue talking maybe offline about this max length property. Uh, we actually have some follow-up work on that, and I'd yeah. love to get your opinion. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, for the inter-org stuff that you mentioned, um, uh, I, note, I note that the design of the RPKI uh, kind of mirrors pretty precisely uh, the theory of how the internet addresses are allocated, assigned, and assigned, and uh, it seems uh, kind of uh, the only reasonable approach to keep that matching. However, uh, the parts of the RPKI system that allow delegation, that essentially matches the delegation of the address space, is not really used a lot. Um, actually, right from the bottom, it's not you. Uh, right from the from the top of the delegation tree, it's not used. And for the lower layers, there are only very few examples of uh, of delegation. And uh, there are quite obviously there are quite obviously some challenges of doing that. And then, of course, uh, there is a lot of legacy problems. Uh, not many operators have, had, have held uh, a policy that for their PA space, actually portable assignments to customers cannot be done. Uh, most people have some legacy there and cleaning uh, and dealing with that is just a pain. So, um... So let me just say that I think that there is room for improvement in doing that. So of course, as you, as you can see, our measurements indicate that the problem is not that big. The tree is quite shallow, as you point out. I do think that there is room for, for improvements in the ROAS. So in particular, our research paper also suggests a, a new thing uh, called the wildcard ROAS that might be able to completely uh, remove these downward dependencies that I've told you about. I'd be very happy to talk about that during the break. Okay. And, okay, so let me stop. Thank you. Matt Pitak, Yahoo, with hopefully an easy question. What are the top 100 ISPs? How did you define those? Oh, okay. So we've simply, we've simply looked at the ISPs in the internet topology. So CADA has this uh, inferred business relations topology. And they're, uh, and they're sort of inferring who is the customer of whom on the internet. So, take, so given this huge list of all ASs, we've sorted them by the number of customers that each AS has, and the top 100 of that list are basically the top 100. You mean 100. the size of the customer or just the number of customers? The number of customers, that's what we've done. So, so a customer with massive prefix blocks that's only one customer gets counted the same as somebody with a little tiny prefix? In our account, yes. Ah, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> uh, Sandy Murphy, Parsons. Uh, could you go to the slide that's the pie chart? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you know, <laughs> well, I probably, if I read that pie chart right, well, gonna, then yeah. there's like 16% of the people who responded said they employed RPKI in some fashion. This I want pie their chart. names, I want their home telephone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so I believe this, this result, as we also point that out in the technical report, is quite optimistic, and that is because the it, the people who are likely to respond and the people who, who are likely uh, to be on the mailing list and forms that we've care. asked. They were live. They were well, breathing. They typed on keyboards. Well, excellent. Actually, I cannot give you their names because the, the, the <laughs> thing is completely anonymous, but I'm very happy that you find this optimistic. Uh, right. um, we also find uh, some evidence that the, there are some people who are doing ROV. Um, you can read the research paper about that. 
Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, in joke, but it is interesting that there actually mm -hmm. were positive responses. Um, let's see. Uh, about your interorganizational dependencies and finding out that people signed ROAs that disenfranchised their customers. Yes, this has been a noted problem for many times. Uh, at least two implementations, RIPE and Dragon Research Labs, when, when a uh, ISP is signing their ROA will say, eh, do you know that you're invalidating the following routes in the routing table and maybe you want to rethink that? Um, so yeah. Human error does come into into play. Uh, your collateral damage slides. You were talking about uh, the one doing um, origin validation that only gets bad routes will be disconnected, but it's being disconnected from the attacker. If it wasn't doing origin validation, it would the traffic wouldn't be getting where it wanted to be getting anyway. Exactly. So I I try to say that. So. If, the, if AS2 in that example was actually doing? Yeah. So it, if it was doing, then that damage was, would have been avoided. The damage is actually in AS2 not doing that. Yes. And yes. Yeah. yeah. So just to uh, The second clarify. thing is the second collateral damage was because the control plane and the data plane were not in sync. And hands to those who thought that was a surprise. It's kind of a well-known problem. Um, and, okay, um, the final thing is, is there's a quote in your, the paper that I've seen that's um, of the same title. You say you expose a new security vulnerability. I would like to say most emphatically, this is not a security vulnerability in RPKI and it's not a, con a security vulnerability in origin validation, it's a misconfiguration by the operator, well known, mentioned in the ops document, you quoted the ops document, it's something that's been known for a long time. Perhaps a bit of an overstatement to say you expose a new security vulnerability, all four of those things are, yeah. The ops document is about five years old. Okay, well, okay, thank you for that. Okay. So, Warren Tamari, Google, this might kind of be following on from what Sandy said, because I didn't really coordinate with her. But you sort of mentioned this um, RFC 7115 um, sort of vaguely mentions the loose rover thing. Mm -hmm. the, the R7115 specifically actually points out, if you do this, you're gonna be shooting yourself in the foot unless the operator actually asks for that, don't generate the longer prefix. So yeah, that's information that people missed. But you know, to some extent, if you give people a powerful tool, they will shoot themselves in the foot until they learn that that hurts, and then hopefully they'll stop. Well, the, the RFC actually uh, mentions that and says uh, specifically that uh, this attack is, you, you'd open yourself to an attack that's um, more likely uh, to be uh, sort of going out under the radar. Uh, I think it's very important to emphasize that this is actually more likely to succeed as well. Um, I, I suspect yeah. you might have mis... I think I wrote some of that text. I okay. You might have misunderstood that. It says that it's more likely to be... No or it was meant to say, maybe it wasn't clear, is that if somebody manages to hijack the 16, that will be more likely to be noticed. It's possible yeah. that that wasn't written very well. Yeah, I think that's the way it is. Okay. Yeah. Sri Ram Nist. Uh, yeah. Yes, RFC 7115 indeed makes that very clear. If you have a slash 20 and, uh, and a slash 24, uh, you should uh, essentially, uh, you only announce those two and no other more specifics. You should, uh, it clearly states that uh, you should try and issue separate rovers for them uh, that will provide the maximum protection from this uh, forged origin attack. Um, my other uh, question is um, when you do the collateral damage studies, uh, you could do a, sensitive ana a sensitivity analysis with regard to the, um, uh, the, uh, the discard policy. So you, you, can, you can have two cases. One, uh, you prefer invalid, and the other one, 
you discard invalid. I, I didn't look like you did the prefer invalid study, did you? So no, the, this entire uh, study actually focuses on the, on the discard invalid. So what would happen if you would do discard invalid? Yes. Yeah, uh, I was just, just suggesting that uh, to mm -hmm. uh, make it complete, right. it might be useful to do a sensitivity, sen sensitivity analysis, consider both cases, what happens if you have uh, mm -hmm. a deep, deep ref. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree, we probably should, should do that. Uh, I think the reason we sort of didn't is because of this uh, deep refer invalid would actually be completely vulnerable to subprefix hijacks. And I think when we've done that, we've, we've chosen, be, because of that we've chosen to focus, but I, I, I definitely agree. So it is interesting to, to show. I just want to say, I'm sticking my um, just, uh, so we're going to close the mic, so Rudiger will be the last uh, question, so we can get into uh, to the break, okay? Okay, Rudiger for Deutsche Telekom again. Uh, so let me close with uh, a rare kind of positive comment uh, from me. Um, uh, your your uh, idea of uh, monitoring and reporting on uh, what's out there uh, uh, quite certainly is heading in a direction where we need to do a little bit more of work. Um, uh, for me, I have to say, I didn't respond to uh, you guys sending our operations uh, a report at some point in time. Um, I'm fair, well, okay, I, I, I didn't see much of an advancement beyond what the RIPE NCC is giving me daily. Um, but uh, kind of, I'm seeing, I'm seeing actually uh, uh, a reason for uh, diving a little bit deeper into what uh, we actually should take as requirements for monitoring uh, and reporting. I think, I think, I think there is actually a little bit more to be done, and to make it uh, 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 an important part of the overall infrastructure. Well, so thank you, thank you for pe pointing and <laughs> going into this direction. I think, I, think, I think there is a little bit more work. Well, thank you very much for this comment. Yes, we, we are, uh, at the end of the day, an academic team, and we definitely believe that there is much more to be done in that system and in that area.